Hey, Technorama viewers, I am here with my good buddy, Eric Butkovich, who I've known for 20 years Hello. at our former job. And uh, Eric, what have you got for us? Well, Chuck, today we have a homemade plasma cutter. Homemade? Homemade. Plans off the internet, a gentleman named Joe Ike. Eichholz, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, found plans off the internet, off of eBay actually, for a whopping dollar ninety nine to build their own <laughs> plasma cutter. So I bought the plans, started collecting last November for all my parts. Over a Christmas vacation, started putting it together, and here's the result today. Now, some of these parts, you did you have them or did you buy them? How did you put this all together? Many of the parts I had laying around since I'm a hobbyist, anyways, with cars and just uh, tinkering around a lot of parts I had a lot of parts I got from you know say Habitat for Humanity so a lot of the parts were dirt cheap now there's some what we'll call hazardous parts in here as well I mean this is this plasma is, is the fourth phase of something there's solid liquid uh, gas and plasma and, and, and to get what does it take to make plasma in order to make the plasma you take a stream of air uh, you create a vortex within that vortex you create you cause an arc a high voltage arc once the high voltage arc is established a lower voltage high amperage DC arc will follow that track of the high voltage arc that will establish the current so we're talking roughly on the initial kickoff about 40 to 50 thousand volts to get the arc started once the arc is established you're probably looking at about 400 volts DC in order to have your cutting. Uh, the plasma, the tip at the plasma, about 30,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, are we running this off a of standard household current and, and then running through some transformers to get it up to that? It is currently running on uh, 220 volts uh, direct. Okay. I do not have any isolation in here at this point in time, which you really should have some kind of isolation. So a word to the wise, if you're going to, you know, don't do this at home unless you have isolation. And before we started filming, uh, Eric was <laughs> had the cover off. I've got some pictures of that. Uh, doing some fine tuning, shall we say, that, uh, what, what was it, the neutral wasn't working quite right? Uh, the, the neutral circuit coming off the contactor, there's some safety features in here, and one is a, a high voltage contactor, so when the contactor is disengaged, the whole unit is dead. I uh, lost my neutral leg on the contactor, so we just bypassed that for now, for <laughs> demonstration purposes only. <laughs> Now, I noticed your chassis here. This is a, a familiar piece of, of equipment. What? Tell me what it was made out of. Uh, this the chassis is uh, actually an old uh, battery backup system that uh, we acquired from work uh, from the dumpster diving. Uh, drug that home, gutted it out, and that is the, the base case for the unit as you see it. What, what were some of the more challenging parts to locate for this unit? the capacitors. There's two uh, uh, 7,500 microfarad capacitors at 400 volts DC uh, in this unit. That's what provides the, uh, the, the high current DC uh, once you get your arc established. Those things are huge. They're, this, they're, they're the size of what, like a 16 ounce beer can? Yeah, probably a little larger than that. <laughs> Uh, those were also an eBay acquisition as well, so a lot of parts off of eBay, you know, like I said, Habitat for Humanity and just scrounging around. And, and I noticed, uh, we'll take a look inside, there's even stove coils from an electric stove in there. What are those for? Uh, the stove coils provide the, the workload some resistance, otherwise if you had just direct coming off of the, the rectifier and off the, ca the caps, you would blow your circuit, you would pop the breaker. It would not handle that uh, type of current. Okay, don't those get hot? I mean, no. isn't it going to... Could, could you fry an egg in there? Uh, uh, yes, you could. Uh, the stove coils will actually get cherry red, just like as if you had the stove on high. You know, if you're, you know, a man trying to cook something fast. Uh, so we have a blower motor on the back of this thing, a squirrel cage, so to speak, forcing air past the coils to help keep them cool. Uh, the duty cycle on this is, you know, you can maybe cut two or three minutes at a time before you have to give it a rest. You know, and then you okay. let, let it cool. You can cut again, let it cool. So you can't go just whole hog on it for eight hours straight? No, could not do that with this unit here. Uh, not quite that industrial. <laughs> Wait till 2.0. <laughs> Correct. Correct. 2.0. All right, let's see it in action.
Eric, I was amazed at how quickly that, that, that cut through the steel. What what thickness of steel is that? The steel we're using today is 16th inch thick. Okay. Um, I've done as high as 3A. 3A steel is a little tougher, a little slower going. But, you know, for my purpose, you know, I'm, I'm a, I restore cars. I have old cars. I need to cut sheet steel and, you know, mend steel back in again. So, really, for what I need, this is just, just fine, just perfect, the, the small stuff. And it, are there any adjustments or fine-tuning you have to do with the different thicknesses of steel? Uh, for a thicker cut, you probably want to turn up your air pressure a little bit. This unit runs from 5 to 20 pounds of air pressure. Anything under 5 pounds, you can't really get an arc started. Anything over 20 pounds, it doesn't want to start either. So the sweet spot's between 5 and 20 pounds. Thicker steel, a little more air pressure. Now, you, you talk about the air pressure. There is an air component to this. When it's, when it's cutting, there's actually a hissing going on. Tell me about that. What is? It's not just electrical, but there's some air in there. Correct. Um, there's air supplied to the unit through a regulator on the front. Okay. That is then regulated right now at 20 pounds. Uh, once under load, it'll probably drop down between about 20 pounds of working. Uh, what the air does is the air will create a vortex at the nozzle. With that vortex, once the arc is established, that's what creates the plasma. I assume this part you didn't just scrounge out of some old car no th this was something i had to acquire this is another ebay acquisition you know as you can see it probably came from the orient and i think that translates to do not use at home or do not try this um, so this was an acquisition they had to go out and seek something you can't just buy what is this pink part around the edge the, the pink tip is a porcelain um, that that's what creates the the vortex funnel or assists it also is used to keep the the metal from splashing back up so it's it's, it's an insulator as well does the airflow I mean, when, when this is cutting there's a fair amount of sparks that are coming out of there does the airflow help to push the sparks away to keep them from flying back is there any safety concerns there I don't think there's any safety concerns at all with that. That's just the way that it, that it works. Okay. You know, with the air forcing through the steel, that's what's causing the cut. It's the air pressure along with the high current uh, DC being applied. So it's, it's a very fine tip, um, almost needlepoint. You, you've got, um, I don't know what we'd call it, a jury-rigged brown wire that's riding outside the handle on here. Tell me about that. <laughs> this particular cutting head... Uh, does not come with a return line for the high voltage arc start circuit. Uh, how the commercial units are doing it, I don't know. Uh, in order for me to get this to work for my purpose, I had to make a supply line for that high voltage return. Okay. So that's an added feature and it's strapped to the outside. So. Now, have you uh, had any electrical experiences? You know, is circuit breakers popping when you were building this? Uh, I guess a little bit of trial and error. You know, the plans that I got off the internet were much a little more crude than this. And with trial and error, I, I learned that I needed to provide some additional functionality and circuitry. Uh, one, for instance, is a cap. You know, to pre-charge the unit. If the unit is not pre-charged and you go right to direct to on, you will pop a 60 amp breaker. Those big beer can capacitors need to be loaded up first, priming the pump, as it were? Correct. Yeah, prime the pump. So I'm priming the pump through a resistor off the 110 side. Wow. Oh, I'd love to see some more cutting. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> we would Chuck like to try it as well? Oh, definitely. We can okay. do that. <laughs> hey, Craig, watch this.